Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to our weekly broadcast. It's uh, 10 a.m. on Thursday once again. And thank you for joining us uh, for uh, this short 30-minute uh, update on what's happening in the world of property. Uh, a look at some things that are happening with our, our own company, Leo Crowdfunding. Um, hear from John Corey from Property Fortress and uh, some tips from him. And of course, always a special guest. And this week is uh, Latoya McDonald. Uh, hello, Latoya. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. And uh, delighted to, to have you on at that long last. We've been planning this for a while. Yes. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's great. Our, our diaries eventually merged and, uh, and we have you on. So really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, in, you. in a few minutes. For any new people joining us, um, we don't use the chat box. Um, we do encourage uh, contributions. Um, so if you go to the Q&A, uh, go to the Q&A function and you can leave any comments or any questions that you have and you'll be able to uh, interact um, with any of the speakers from there. So David Johnson is my name, CEO of Leo Crowdfunding and Equity Property Crowdfunding Platform and my co-host, I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, John Corey, um, actually broadcasting today from the USA. Um, property investor since early 1980s. I just had to note that in a conversation I was having in Facebook. And buy and hold, mostly tech guys. So these days, what I really like is the opportunity to look at deals through crowdfunding because then the information comes to me. I can make a decision. I can invest in different strategies. And the best part is I get to partner up with um, someone that knows what they're doing, if that's uh, what I've come to my conclusion on the deal. And then I have a built-in business partner who's going to get up early and stay up late. That sounds good. And I can't resist this. You were you're commenting to the toy and myself that uh, the building on the right uh, on our slide, uh, you used to work there uh, yes, a number of years yes. ago. In fact, if you think of the little pointedness to the building, um, I when I worked there, that was Swiss Bank House. So that was the worldwide headquarters for the investment bank for Swiss Bank Corporation, the oldest of the three big Swiss banks. Um, this was pre-bridge. There was no bridge there at the time. So yeah, it was back in the dark ages, you know, quill pens and all that. Yeah, I was going to say that kind of dates dates some of your working life. If, it, if anyone can remember uh, this part of London pre-bridge, um, John was working at that point in London. Yeah. So, uh, but you know that church was already there. That that's that was there before me. <laughs> that 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 predated John Corey, <laughs> but but you, but you predate the bridge. Um, excellent. Okay, let's get into it. I want to get on to our, our guest as soon as possible. Um, we always do a market update. Uh, just by way of something that's that's topical, something that's that's worth a, a mention in conversation. And this is what caught my eye uh, this week. Uh, it's an article um, written by a Matthew Lane uh, from a Property Investor Today. And uh, it mentions or alludes to the fact that there's a lot of uh, pioneering research happening, um, this sort of move towards carbon zero. Um, and what they're investigating or researching um, is whether or not they can create a completely plastic-free house, um, obviously as fuel efficient as possible, but it was the plastic-free uh, that got me thinking when you think of so many elements of, of either the build or uh, people's lives and house that involves plastic. Um, is this viable, John, do you think? Is it pie in the sky? Is it, is it worth investigating and putting money into? And is there a value in it? So, well... If we separate the putting money into it, um, plastic free, of course, because there was a point in time when houses were built and plastic hadn't been invented. And I don't remember that. I wasn't around at that point. But um, what, it, what I find a little odd is, is it during the construction phase or is it also during the occupancy? Because getting the occupant not to use plastic. And then second is if you're going to do plastic free in the construction and that's all, does that mean when you write notes with a pen, the pen is in plastic pen, that the package that arrived on the site delivered by Amazon with your screws and nails that you ran out of doesn't have any plastic in the package? I mean, it's difficult to understand where they're drawing the line, but I could definitely see the building materials in particular because you look at historic homes in, in Britain and most of them, the historic ones were built long before there was plastic 
ninth and over what 70 years wouldn't have any plastic so mm -hmm. that's a good a good point a good point well, i suppose you could say that there's obviously construction methods and um uh, different materials um the introduction of plastic obviously helped um in terms of the price of build the quality of build but i, I take your point that at one point we didn't have plastic and therefore it's possible to go back to that point yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely possible because, frankly, British building standards are pretty ancient anyway, so it may not be that hard. Yeah. So, Latoya, uh, you're obviously from uh, New Zealand originally um, and uh, moved over here. So any any take or any experience in your property journey with this whole concept of carbon zero and plastic free, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, um, I think um, John's got some interesting points there. And um, I think anyone who who's behind this and believes in it will definitely make it happen. Um, so it's going to come down to the individuals themselves building and developing and, and what their beliefs and morals are. Um, I think coming from New Zealand, this is something Okay, seem to have a technical glitch on the toilet side. Also farming and that sort of thing, my partner was like, recycling <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> so you know it, it depends we've I've almost had it beaten into me from New Zealand about all of this and then I came um you know to, to my partner and his family and it was totally different it hadn't been beaten into them so yeah it's it, it's yeah it's going to come down to the individuals the developers themselves really I think yeah okay there's, Th a, thank you. there's a point in the Q&A that there's also if you broaden the definition there are plastics that are made with uh corn uh, starch and other things so they're they're environmentally positive produced plastics rather than oil-based plastics so depends again on what the definition is for this article mm. Mm. okay yeah, that, that's interesting so they're talking about building these uh, six prototype houses so it'll definitely mm -hmm. be interesting to see the the prototypes uh, when they when they arrive i mean even okay. the tools the builders use will have plastic in some of the tools so it, it's an awkward topic yeah, how far, how far do you go? Well, um, moving on then to our Ask John segment. This is where um, people have the opportunity to pose a question uh, to John and uh, uh, get some feedback from his extensive knowledge and his experience. Um, so one discussion or one question that's come up here, John, is what are the potential advantages of an income type investment that is based on rental income? So I suppose they're they're thinking as opposed to maybe investing in a development or construction project, uh, investing in a in a project that is already built and rented, uh, and therefore your returns come from the rent. Um, so, what do you think are the potential advantages and, and I suppose the potential disadvantages uh, of that type of an income investment? Well, if you think about your pension or retirement, it's all about having an income. It's not having lots of assets, but no income and. The joke in the property circles is um, equity rich, cash poor, which means you've got all this equity trapped in these buildings, but you have no income. Uh, you'll see that in London where you might have very high value properties, maybe you've built up a lot of equity, but your rent isn't, is, isn't proportional. And then you have people who say, oh, you should go invest in Belfast, go invest in Northern England or out in Wales because you get better yields. And what they're sort of saying is, capital value is low and it's all about the income. And if your value even goes up at all in the next 10 years, you'll be lucky, but, you're, but you'll have solid income. So two points, one is that equity versus the income and you probably need an income at some point to live. On the other side, you have this idea that the income underlies or defines or um, is the foundation of why the asset has value. So when we look at crypto or anything else where there's no income, it's all speculation in the sense that you expect someone else will think it's valuable. You'll expect someone else might want to buy it from you. And that defines its value. Where having an asset that produces an income, um, it, in a sense, it could drop in value. But if you're happy with the income, if you have a business and it has an income, sometimes you know you buy stuff, it's machinery, it goes down in value. It doesn't appreciate. It's it's a machine, it's a tool, um, but it's producing an income and you can live off that income. So I would say the core fundamental for real estate investing is you should look at income producing properties. Um, there's a guy who says always buy cash flow ABC. 
So what he's saying is always look at properties and their income, don't worry about their capital value. Um, it may be tied to the stage of your investing career. And David highlighted just a second ago, you can comment more if you want about how when you're a developer, it's not about the income, it's about your ability to get it sold. And that's how you can get caught with your pants down around your ankles, so to speak. Because if the market for sales drops, they may be perfectly nice properties, but if you can't get a buyer, you're a bit stuffed. Um, where if you have an income, it keeps you in the game and you can ride out the peaks and drops. Yeah, yeah. I think also it depends on individuals' aspirations through their investing. Uh, I don't think it's always a case of one's better than the other. It's a case of what does the individual want? You know, there's some want to speculate and maybe have higher returns um, and are happy with higher risk. Uh, others are happy to say, you know what, if something's been built and it's rented, then, then you know, I'm happy to take a lower return, um, but have the, the confidence, if you like, that, that, you know, the risk isn't the same. Um, with well, that, with see, the I don't think it's even necessarily a lower return. I think it's cash flow keeps you in the game. And mm. if you're mm. hoping for appreciation, cash flow lets you stay in the game long enough for that to maybe happen. Mm. Yes, that, that's a good point. But suppose if some people look at the market, they might think, well, uh, you know, senior debt comes at sort of s s single digit figures. And then if I'm going to do a MES date where I'm getting second charge security, I might want 13, 14, 15%. But if I'm going to go equity with capital at risk, I'm going to want 20% for that. In some of these type of income deals, the, the return might be projected around about 12, 13, 14. And some people might say, well, you know what? I can get second charge um, on, on, a, on a MES deal for that. So why would it take risk on equity? Uh, that, that's I think, just the mindset. I think they're being slightly naive or they're comparing two things that aren't terribly comparable. Uh, it depends on whether they're, if, if they're capped on the income and there's no appreciation. So if you buy up north or in Belfast and, okay, I'm not expecting the value to go up and the income's sort of flat. Well, that's possibly just a bad deal. So it's not really a good comparator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for that. That gives people some food for thought, uh, which is always great. And uh, of course, uh, now John and myself are trying to give any type of financial advice. Uh, we're just discussing this topic of investment and giving uh, people some things to think about. So uh, before we go to our special guest, um, we held our shareholder um, project. Uh, what well, was the final uh, project uh, webinar uh, on uh Thursday night, if I remember right. It's hard to remember the days at the minute. They're going that fast. Um, and, and this is being uh, currently paid out. So this was a five house project uh, by Hitesh and Creation Tech 99 and originally projected a 25% ROI. Um, it did take a little bit longer or moved into what we call the ratchet phase. Um, and uh, full SPV accounts uh, were provided, uh, reviewed by us on our FCA principal. And uh, the project is, is uh, complete in terms of the, the crowdfunding. And uh, the developer is able to pay back a 30% um, ROI. Um, so, John, this is one I know you uh, were involved in at the start. You, you know the client. And uh, great that this has turned into success. It's a really big win for the client and for the platform and the investors, of course. Yeah, I mean, this actually was, um, at least Tatesh is the guy at the top of the three. Uh, it was his first UK-based project. It was more or less his introduction to the UK market. Um, he's got experience as a civil engineer and developer in other countries. And the uh, project was definitely like a COVID project, as in started more or less during COVID or almost at the start. And then all the normal hassles that we're seeing these days, and I say normal with inverted commas, um, you know, supply chain issues, prices fluctuating, staff becoming ill or unavailable. So, uh, and they powered through, it, it finished uh, within the timelines that they were expecting, the extended timelines that were in the documents. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm, as an investor and also as someone that helped behind the scenes put this together, uh, I was happy with it. You know, passive investor, angel investor, whatever you want to call me when it comes to one of the crowd. I think there was 40 something people in this one. 43 or so from memory. Yeah. And and I, as an investor, you end up seeing 
the details at some level of all the investors um, subject to GDPR. And there were a lot of investors that were in this deal, uh, a very small amount, allowing them to get used to how this works. Um, so clearly there was some education uh, benefits there for those that wanted to understand what's going on behind the curtain. Yeah, and there was some good feedback on the on the Zoom uh, webinar. Um, people who enjoyed learning and, and identifying the, the challenges that the test had and how he dealt with them. So some real value and, uh, you know, fantastic that people have uh, received their uh, their investment back at the RI projected. So um, we currently have a live project on, which is the um, Beckentree Avenue up in Chadwell Heath um, by the PLMD group, um, AJ and his staff. Uh, this is nine apartments on the commercial ground floor. It's fully built, fully let. They've done a phenomenal job in the building. You can see the before and after um, pictures there. Um, this is a two-year project, uh, projected to return 24% over the two years, but this is actually paid back quarterly. Um, so it's effectively projected at 3% a quarter uh, over the two years. Maximum raise is at 200,000, minimum is 100,000. Uh, there's uh, 21 investors already have invested, and you can see the figure there. And we're doing another webinar um, just to really explain more about the, the type of, of income deal this is. Um, so, John, we were talking offline there. You know, sometimes it's hard to put into sentences this income type um, projection. Uh, the quarterly payment is obviously very attractive as a, an income um, type uh, project to some investors. Um, and it's just about getting that message out for investors to understand what, what this is. Well, it may be a different way to state it. And what's on the screen is the approved version. So I would say it's 12% a year. Um, and whether it's exactly 12% because of the compounding and all that other stuff, but effectively 12% a year for, and, and that's Um, so this is net. If it's quarterly paid out, it's 12% a year, and you wanted to do simple math, even though it's slightly inaccurate, you're saying it's 1% a month. Um, now, this is a rental income. This is not guaranteed. You don't have a charge. Um, you're an actual owner. So it's sort of like you buy a, a property in London and you wanted to get uh, rent from it, and this is offering you a 12% net. Well, Actually, people are normally happy at 4% net in London. So uh, yeah, you have to read the document. You have to get your head around it because this is truly a buy and hold. I think it's 24 month projected time period before the developer will, or, or the owner, I should say, is going to buy back the shares or somehow cash you out. But this is definitely an income play. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So if you want to know more about this, then join us on Monday night at 7 p.m. Um, AJ and the team will be there and we'll, we're will we going to focus um, a little bit on the project, but also this whole concept of the income uh, and the benefits of having a, a regular income by sharing the rent uh, as opposed to um, a construction type project. So join us on Monday night. So um, we've also got another project, which again is very near being um, going uh, view deal on the platform, uh, mixed use HMO down in uh, Bognor Regis from Target 5. So, so that's Target 5, that one? Yes, that's a, a Target okay. 5 yep. down, down in, uh, in the, the south. So Latoya, waiting patiently. Um, thank you for joining us today. Do you want to um, just give a quick introduction in your background and uh, where you're from? And then we'll move into a couple of discussions around your uh, your experience and your case study. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm Latoya. I live in Cornwall, but I am from New Zealand. Um, and I've got a real estate background um, from working in real estate in New Zealand um, and also having property investments, um, <laughs> property investments down there as well. Um, and yeah, so um, end of 2010, moved to Cornwall and got into property. So I've, I've done New Zealand. Now I've done the UK as well so um, and I set up a property business which is Harcourt White Property that you can see there um, and that's a livings and property management business doing single lets, HMOs and serviced accommodation in Cornwall um, and also me and my partner invest in property in Cornwall um, so so 
everything's property. That is what we do. Um, and I also run some networking events down here as well. Yeah, we're looking forward to uh, discussing that bit with you. So uh, again, so everything you've done in your professional life is, is property. I think you've literally <laughs> yeah. moved straight in from, from post-education straight into, uh, so what was your, was your first job in New Zealand? Uh, so my first job in New Zealand um, was uh, working in a real estate office, basically stuffing envelopes and answering the phone calls. And um, and that was my entry level. Uh, you really do have to start at the bottom there. And I, I was going to be the best at whatever I did. And I was the best phone answer person. <laughs> Excellent. No, I, I love that mentality. It's something you, you, you bring across when anyone talks to you. And we've obviously been talking off and on for about a year but a year now maybe 14 months and yeah, yeah your enthusiasm and your your desire just to make sure you do everything right uh comes across which is one reason why i think you're very successful uh, in, in what you do so so you've talked about your international experience obviously different markets new zealand and, and, and the uk is there any any like big comparisons that, that, that are differences in the two markets yeah so um i the reason why i love i can only really talk about cornwall because that's where i've invested but the returns are unbelievable. I mean, I remember when I first uh, bought a HMO in Cornwall and I was telling my friends back home, the money that I was making, it just blew their minds. I mean, uh, you know, in New Zealand, you, if you are you know, on decent income, say you're a dentist or a doctor or something, you might buy an investment property and offset that against your income so you can reduce your tax bill. <laughs> It's not the same that I'm experiencing in Cornwall. Like when we talk about cash flow, we're talking about actual cash flow, which is what John touched base on before, cash in the bank. So um, it's very exciting here. And I have no excitement to be rushing back home to buy investment property, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> and then your, your speciality then is in, in sort of HMOs. So- Well, um, one second, a comment on that, just so it's really clear. Um, People in New Zealand expect to lose money on their property every month, negative cash flow. Yes. So this idea that you have money after your bills that you can put into the bank account is what Latoya is talking about. And that is a bit of a foreign concept to many New Zealand uh, investors. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 you know, as a real estate agent, you earn, you earn very good money there. Um, so having property is, is not a cash flow thing. It's a reduce the tax bill thing. <laughs> <laughs> so very strange very uh interesting but um yeah I, I i much prefer my cornish investments but um i am actually known for managing hmos that's what our business is known for i'm good at it um but it's not the only thing that i do but it is what we're known for so um it's a special skill apparently <laughs> to managing hmos <laughs> yeah i think you have to be certainly um motivated and uh attention to detail are probably two things that come to mind when you're when you're uh, dealing with that um i often uh admire uh, tina from target five um and her um management company that they do uh, along with that and again just the amount of plates that that, that you have to spin I, I guess when you're dealing with the hmos particularly is uh yeah it's it's, uh, it's impressive so you have to be focused on it so if that's your expertise uh in hmos that's that's great that's you've built your your reputation on uh, i suppose it's the success in hmos and your international experience has led you into uh, the world of networking and i know you you speak regularly at events um i think you actually host or run uh, an event as well do you yep so i am running and hosting the cornwall property event so I, I run that. So if you're ever coming down to Cornwall, make sure you organize it in line with my event so I can see you. Um, and I also run a business networking event in Cornwall as well. Um, I'm quite interested in business. I think it's important to support um, businesses um, in Cornwall for, for me because I live here. It's, it's my community. Um, so that's what I do. I, I love the property investment, but I also love supporting businesses as well. Mm, that's good get given something back so you obviously you and john share a passion for for networking events so what, what do you feel is the value that that i suppose the value you bring to those events and the value that those events bring to those in the local community involved in, in property yeah so on the um property networking side um i i love to bring something 
difference, some knowledge that, you know, um, is not the same old thing that you're getting on the circuit around the country. So something interesting that's happening in our area that's really relevant. Um, I love that. I also think it's important for um, some newbies to come in and network and the more experienced ones to, to share some good nuggets that are going to put those people on the right path. Um, you don't have to share your entire business with somebody, but just some pointers so that people are on the right path because it is the next generation coming in. Um, and on the business networking, that is very much um, teeing up referrals. So if I know that somebody needs this over here, it's teeing that up to, to keep the business in Cornwall and keep it, you know, um, keep the, little, the, the economy going. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Uh, any comments, John, on the networking side? I know that's something that's close to your heart as well. No, just that uh, <clears throat> it's important to do. And also how during the COVID period, people sort of had to pivot how they organized and run networking so that you can continue to maintain those relationships. Uh, we'll see again, I think, a transition as people uh, generally come out of this COVID period and what does networking mean? But again, it, it classically is about connecting with people, sharing information, learning how to extend your network so that when you need something, you know who to turn to and, when you, and other people can reach out to you. Yeah. So in terms of uh, takeaways then, Latoya, we're going to go on to your case study now and, and looking forward to talking about that for a few minutes before we, we close. But is there any... Any takeaways you'd like to share with the attendees, either just with your journey in property, with, with HMOs, or even just what it's been like, um, as John says, having maybe to pivot aspects of your, your business model in the last two years? Yeah, I think for um, probably as the rest of the country is, um, property in Cornwall has been absolutely crazy. The market has gone mental. Um, we had a we did have a housing crisis before COVID, but it didn't make it to the um, to the news to the BBC. But now we're on there. Um, so you know we we had a housing crisis beforehand. We still have one and we're going to have one for the near future as well. So um, we're just not doing enough developments down here. Um, so my thing is creating homes for, for people in Cornwall and, you know, people working here, living here. You know, we, you know, I don't know what people think about a housing crisis, but it is not just the people on low incomes. It's everywhere. There is a gap. Um, we've got a few extra issues down here of, you know, the holiday homes um, coupled with some some um, you know, interesting tax changes that have in the last five years but I won't get into that today because I could talk for ages about um, that, that side of things but you know my thing is about creating additional properties that can be rented down here for people so, so yeah we, we need it. Okay that's uh, always good to meet a, meet a need. So case study wise, we're uh, live on the platform today. People can go to our homepage and a case study from uh, Latoya is on there. You can uh, obviously download it and have a look at it. Um, so this is a completed project. This is not an investment. This is what we call a case study, one that's complete, but it does give you an idea as to um, how Latoya does her projects. Uh, an example of one that's fully complete so you can analyze it and look at it and, and decide if this is something that you feel you would like to hear more about. Uh, and there's a recorded interest box. So if you like what you read, then you can um, simply leave your email address and an amount that you may be interested to invest if this pro type of project uh, came to the platform. So so just to talk us through this one then, uh, Latoya, in terms of this, this case study. Yep. Uh, so this one was an interesting one because uh, as we all do, you know, we've got our alerts online, you know, we're dealing with the estate agents. And when this one came up, it was advertised as a three bedroom property, which I just knew it couldn't be right because it was in terraced. And I knew I'd, I'd already been as part of my business, my letting agency had already viewed one of the other properties in the terrace. So I knew it wasn't advertised or it might not be advertised right. Um, and then indeed, when we actually went to go view it, I was sort of, I was walking around the house doing, trying not to do that. I was getting all excited <laughs> because I was like, ah, oh, it's not advertised properly. This is fantastic. So, um, so yeah, so it was a, it was a, a nice find. Um, and yeah, it, it was a very good property. It had parking as well, which if anyone knows me, parking excites me. I get very excited about parking. So, um, so yeah, so it was a very good find. 
Okay, excellent. And then here's just some uh, one so the on the prior photo, what's the um thing in the water, I guess island? Ah, that's um St. Michael's Mount. That's actually a castle that you can go to. And when the mm -hmm. tide is out, if you look from where the houses are towards that, you can actually walk along there when the tide is out. You just don't want to get caught. Okay. I did a bicycle ride and I remember passing this very early in the morning. Ah. And, and you could see it off on the right side. So it's beautiful. It is, it is lovely. Um, since I've moved to this country, I've become very um, uh, into history and your buildings. So that is definitely an exciting one to go to. Yeah. See, pe people are learning so much about John Corey on this on this weekly broadcast. <laughs> so we now, we now have him working in London before the bridge, um, yeah. heading across to the, what used to be the headquarters of, uh, of the Swiss Bank. And now we have him on a bike early morning at dawn along a beach in Cornwall. We're learning a well, lot today. It, it was a hundred mile day from Land's End to wherever we finished up that day. And this, I think we passed about 9 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> very good, Beautiful. very good. So there, there's some pictures of the before, and then obviously you've done your uh, your magic, so to speak. And uh, so, so just explain, um, when you say about how it was perhaps not advertised properly, what, yeah. what just explain what you meant by that? Um, so uh, there was a loft room, which is the top uh, left picture you can see. That was a loft room there um, that wasn't being being marketed properly. Um, and then also, if you look on the, um, I wonder if I've got a picture of it here. Uh, the room there, the grey room with the white bedding with the flowers in the window, that was the living room, like a reception room. So that wasn't counted either. So um, it was just, it was just, yeah, it was perfect. There's more for us. value. There's more value yeah. uh, and and opportunity within the yeah. building than what appeared on the. Yes, on, on the, it was. On the it was just literally not marketed to its full potential, which was is fine for us. Um, but also, an interesting one. We we found this. We we got it under offer. We started spending money with the solicitors and our own builder that we'd worked with previously saw it and thought he'd come in on it. Right. <laughs> so I had to so, go to the estate agent and go, uh, no, no, we're working together here, aren't we? So <laughs> we're the joys, in the right. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the joys of property investing and, and yeah. purchasing and the, yeah. and the journey. So just then in terms of the, the numbers on this, so you, you obviously um, increased the value uh, of, of the property and, and now you have a, a, a nice um, sort of rental income um, yep. coming from this property and you still still own this one, do you? Yes, yes, we own this one. It's a, a good a good property for our portfolio. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's in a very good area. Like I said, it's got a parking, which is, top priority to me <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's it's a very good one we won't be getting rid of this one fantastic okay so if anyone wants to uh, read more about this project say it's now a case study on the platform uh, and you can go and download uh, the the document have a good read at it uh, and then as i say there's a, a register record your interest um opportunity there um you can leave an email address um, an amount you may look to invest in this type of project uh, and at some point in the future, to tell you, you may have a, a raise on the platform. So this is a bit of sort of marketing for you, just engaging with some investors and and, and gauging appetite and obviously building your profile um, with our investor tribe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, love connecting with people. So yeah, any questions, let me know. Fantastic. Well, so thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate that. And uh, look forward then to hopefully uh, one, at some point. Go ahead, John. One other point, uh, actually, Latoya just reminded me. So people can also use the forum that's associated with case study and they can post questions in the forum. They can have interactions with other investors who might post in the forum. Latoya will obviously be there to answer questions. So if you want to dive a bit deeper and you had a specific question about the project, use the forum tab on the uh, website associated with this case study. Mm -hmm. Lovely, yeah, okay. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good. Yes, John, thank you for uh, for reminding me. That's an important important part of the function, the the, the forum. Uh, you can uh, interact there. Okay, so just to remind people, um, if you like, the next event, if you like, is Monday night, the webinar with um, AJ and the team regarding back and tree uh, and this income type project. So you can quickly screen grab that if you want. Uh, it was in our weekly update as well. 
um, but those who, who want to come to that, 7 uh, p.m. Uh, this Monday, uh, we'll be doing a 30-minute webinar on this project. And that is us for today. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we have a, a guest lined up for next week, but he didn't just confirm 100%, so I don't want to put his picture up, unfortunately. Um, but we'll uh, confirm that as soon as we can. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone next Thursday. So anything from you, John, before we finish? Just on the website, when you look at Latoya's case study, also there's another case study in Cornwall. So you can start to understand Cornwall, the different strategies in Cornwall. Um, it's a great place to go visit. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, for, uh, for being here. And we'll see you again next week. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.